Well, 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 well. Look what we've got here. Another British UFC champion. And he did it by dethroning the pound for pound number one in the world. Of, you know, depending on what week it is. If it's Volkanovski fight week, he's number one. If it's Usman fight week, Usman's number one. The standard Hen and Brow procedure. Hen and Brow is a monster. Um, yeah. Wow, crazy, eh? I, you know, if you think I'm going to gloat about British guy being a uh, champion, obviously no. I don't give a shit where you're from if you've got an interesting fighting style. And um, to me, Edwards always had an interesting fighting style. I mean, I, I put most of... Oh, no, I think I put about half of my discussion of this fight from the boycast. Uh, on the YouTube channel, so you can go check out the preview of that uh, of that episode of the Boycast, uh, or you can go back and listen to the Boycast. But um, I was saying, like, there are a lot of things about Leon Edwards' style that interest me in this matchup, but I also think he's got a lot of... There's a few holes that are real stumbling blocks for him. Uh, you know, I think if you put... And then I was trying to get... I was trying to work out a better person to put his skills onto. I was like, oh, no, Welterweight's actually pretty crap. <laughs> but... Um, no, the madman pulled it off, and uh, we'll get into that in a minute. I'm first off, fuck me. Let please let's never ever do fights at Salt Lake City again. I mean, Dana White has already said that he wants to, but Salt Lake City, Mexico City, Denver, Colorado, anything that's over like twenty feet elevation or altitude, or whatever you want to call it, fuck off. Because it, it means that guys gas in the first round. Um, it was pretty noticeable that on this okay-looking card, maybe three fights were good. There were a couple of quick stoppages, but um, one of those fights was only good because both guys were absolutely gassed from the start. Uh, and we'll talk plenty about that, I'm, I'm sure, in a minute. But um, basically the whole middle bit of this card from... Arichi Lang versus Jay Perrin to Paulo Costa versus Lee Rockhold, not including Paulo Rockhold. Well, yeah, including that. It was just everything was different because of the uh, altitude, sorry, the elevation. Um, and I think it's even more absurd when, you know, I was saying this before I watched a fight early on. You know, I was going back and watching the uh, fight pass prelims and DC said it and then seemed to regret saying it, and everyone got very uncomfortable in the booth. He said, you know, if you're not being paid very much, you're not going to be able to come out here and acclimatise for two weeks, like Leon Edwards and Kamaru Usman have. And I went, yes, that's what I've been saying. <laughs> like, you know, nothing makes you look smaller time, especially when you're doing all this, like, it's not a job, it's an opportunity, and then you're like, well, how am I supposed to prepare to do my opportunity, not job, properly, if I can't afford to come out and acclimatise to whatever it is, 4,000 feet above sea level. But I presume the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce or someone, uh, you know, visit Salt Lake City or whatever, is paying the UFC a lot of money to go there. Or maybe Mormons just love fights and we didn't know. Keep sweet and bleed is what they say. Keep sweet and just bleed. But yes, this main event, let's, let's start with this. Leon Edwards versus Kam Kamaru Usman. I talked extensively about like the ins and outs of the very boring stuff that's quite interesting if you train a lot um, or if you're really into the minutiae of, of how positions work, but wouldn't be to everyone's taste. And you saw a lot of that through this fight. Leon Edwards, great job getting up, great job breaking away for the most part. Um, you saw him doing lots of, if, he got, if Usman got the back body lock, he was trying to uh, feed his elbow through first and turn into him or swing the arm over the head. There were just lots of cool little sequences where he'd get one grip fight going, you know, he'd be pummeling with one hand and then Usman would move to chain, to stop him from doing it and he'd swim the other hand in or he'd swim his arm all the way across the body or he'd turn his back or something, you know, just doing lots of cool things to keep the action moving. Um, and that was one of the ones that I mentioned, the Bilal Mohammed fight. Bilal pushed him to the fence with a, a good single underhook pin and... Um, Edwards went to head post on him, you know, when, when he puts his head underneath the opponent's head, where he can start moving his hips away and get the knees in and so on. Um, but he started doing that, and uh, as Bilal moved to stop him from circling away along the fence, uh, Ed Edwards dug the other underhook and got the double underhooks and turned Bilal onto the fence. And I said, that was really interesting, but it was one round in what was supposed to be a five-round fight, and uh, Bilal might not have even started 
you know, might not have even warmed up at that point. But he did exactly the same thing in the first round of this one. He got put to the fence by Usman with an underhook and an overhook. He used his head as a post to threaten circling out. And then as uh, Usman moved along the fence to, start, uh, to stop him from circling out uh, in the direction of his head post and his butt, he dug the underhook uh, and, and got double underhooks. And then immediately he went into that trip off the fence because if you get double underhooks and you pull the guy's hips into you, you're in a pretty strong position. Um, and he immediately tripped Usman into the mount, which was very impressive. Lovely back take as Usman turned onto his side. Um, and yeah, just spent the round on his back. Threatening the choke, but not really threatening the choke that effectively Usman was able to hold onto his uh, hands and gloves. Let's get into it because there was a lot of cheating going on in this fight. Um, it was It was very much in the trenches stuff. If all you're doing is pummeling for openings and stuff along the fence and pummeling for control. Um, yeah, people are going to grab wrists and grab, sorry, grab um, gloves and grab the fence a lot. Uh, it did seem like Leon Edwards got caught the times that he was doing it and Kamara Usman got ignored the times that he was doing it. So um, kind of unfortunate how that shook out. It always see, you know, because it just ends up with accusations that Herb Dean's on UFC pay or whatever. When in fact, he's just inept. Sipped my tea like Kermit the Frog then. Um, second through fourth round was much more Kamaru centric. Um, I think part of that was Leon Edwards choosing to stand on the fence. We talked about this in the pre-fight um, on the boycast. I was saying, you know, his, his ring crafts look a lot better. He, he's keeping the range. He's staying out of distance and he's circling off the fence. And then from round two to round four, he just stands on the fence. Uh, almost inviting the clinches. And I think maybe he thought he could get off some good strikes from there. He had gone to the fence in the first round, used his pummeling to get better position, and then tripped towards the centre of the fence, of the cage um, where he took top position and then the back. So it, he could have been trying to operate some kind of counter-wrestling game plan. Um, it's just that he ended up... Kamaru Usman was able to throw punches on him uh, along the fence, and Edwards would try and do like a shoulder roll, stonewall cover-up, um, sometimes he'd switch to orthodox, but he because he's naturally a southpaw, he'd start shoulder rolling with his right shoulder instead, and he'd end up sort of crisscrossing himself up. But um, it was yeah, it was a bit odd because he was he seemed comfortable. Kamara wasn't landing a ton of damaging strikes, but if you know you're already at a points loss if you're both wrestling. And even if you're doing everything and stopping the takedowns and you're doing great, as we're going to get into with Jose Aldo, if you're the one with your back to the fence, you're still going to lose if nothing else happens. Um, but even more than that, he was letting Usman pile up points by just standing on the fence and blocking stuff. When he did get taken down, he sprung up most of the time. He was doing a really good job. I think he gave up his back in round four, was it? Um, you know, and then round five, he got an amazing pep talk from his corner. Uh, that, that guy going, uh, why are you feeling sorry for yourself? And, and just telling him off. Um, he, ha he has brother Fabian, who's a Bellator fighter in his corner. Um, and yeah, that, that long time coach, I don't know his name, but he's he's always there shouting at him going, go on, Rock, go on, Rocky. But he came out for the fifth. Dean Thomas, Daniel Corbier, Joe Rogan, all saying how dejected Leon Edwards is looking. And it was it was classic Leon Edwards in that, you know, they were talking about, um, they were they had to do a plug for UFC 2, is it 280, with Nate Diaz versus uh, Kamzat Shemaev, and John Anik called them both enigmas. And you were like, I, I think uh, Nate Diaz is about as far from an, an enigma as you can get. You know what he's thinking, and you know he's going to say it, and you know what he's going to do in the cage. Um, and you also probably know how that fight's going to play out. But Leon Edwards genuinely is a bit of an enigma because we spent so long last week talking about how he's a decision fighter who makes bad decisions in the fifth round and fourth rounds and even third round in three round fights. He's just not built for longevity. And I was I was starting to wonder, does he have like AD, uh, what's it called ADHD or something like that? Because he sticks to a game plan and then he just suddenly won't. You know, he'll get distracted and get ba uh, you know banged over the head or taken down or something like that. But um, this was the complete opposite side of the uh, Leon Edwards chaos, which was he scored his first finish in years. Um, his last finish, I think, was Peter Sabota. And that was the, the fight that I was talking about last time, which was terrible because he's just rolling around on the floor, tit for tat submission exchanges with Peter Sabota, who you, you won't even hear his name anymore, Peter Sabota. He wasn't great. Yeah, first finish in years against one of the pound for pound great guys. 
in the fifth round when everyone's counted you out. Just incredible. But I was going back through this fight and I was trying to work out if he'd actually thrown any head kicks up to that point. Because he hit some nice intercepting knees to the body. He threw some nice kicks to the body. He'd flick his hand and then throw a a low kick. I don't think he threw a high kick up to that point. Whereas Bilal Muhammad, he came out and kicked him in the head in round one. So it could have been that he was playing it safe, not wanting to get a, a leg caught. You know, he, the first body kick he threw in this fight, Kamaru Usman grabbed it, and Leon Edwards did a, a, a short, stampy teep with the same leg to free his leg. You know, when you go kick, stamp with the same leg. Um, you'll see it all the time in Muay Thai. So getting your leg caught, obviously a concern against Kamaru Usman. Um, didn't he run Masvidal into the floor off a, a parried kick in one of their fights? But yeah, he just timed it perfectly. He flicked out a little left straight. Kamari dipped his head all the way off to the side and reached to parry, you know, the belt and braces. But, uh, yeah, leaves your whole right side open. And up came the left kick, knocked him out in one blow. Didn't hit him on the ground. Very classy. Because if, if he'd been thinking about it, he'd have gone, oh, I've got a rematch almost definitely. I should try and brain him while he's on the mat. <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, unbelievable comeback. Um, I was impressed with all the pummeling for position and the technical stuff in this fight. Wasn't super impressed by Edwards. I mean, he was scoring points, but we were talking about in the first fight that he'd get in faster and then Kamaru would hit him on the counter before he got out because he would just stand there after his strikes. And that happened a few times in this fight too. He was not really getting away from his man. Which was weird because, you know, that could be a stylistic matchup thing. That could be something about the two of them matched up that just means that he doesn't get away from Kamaru Usman after he strikes. But... I'm more inclined because I've seen him do it against like Bilal Muhammad and Nate Diaz and people like that. I mean, I wouldn't count Nate Diaz because, as I've said, he's not great. But I've seen him do it against uh, Vicente Luke, Bilal Muhammad, good fighters. I think the fact that he wasn't doing it and that he was just standing along the fence probably more to do with being tired. Meanwhile, Usman always drives at an amazing pace, always in great condition. Um, you know, did look a bit more tired than usual, but managed to keep his pace up and, and be the active fighter for the majority of the, of the 25 minutes. Well, not 25 minutes, 23 and a bit, 24 and a bit. So now one or two things happens. Um, either Kamaru Usman comes back and beats him or Leon Edwards, um, I, I could see him doing a Frankie Edgar BJ Penn 2 thing where uh, Ed, Edgar took, what was it, three rounds to get BJ Penn down the first time in their first fight. And in their second fight, he came out and took him down immediately because he just had the confidence from having gone 25 minutes with him and got him down several times. That's one of the crazy ways that these things can go. In the rematch, the the fighter who um, scraped by in the first can look even better in the second. Or the the fighter who lost the first can be like, you know, it was a fluke and come back and be even better. Um, So excited for that. They were talking about, they were saying, well, Dana White teased Wembley. I very much doubt it, but they could do the 0-2. It would be at 5 a.m. because they don't care that much about the UK market. Um, not enough to fuck up their pay-per-views at any rate. But apparently uh, Kamara's going to take some time off, heal some injuries or whatever, because he's been pretty active lately. So there's always the chance of the Masvidal fight or a Colby Covington fight. Um, yeah, it's a weird situation because uh, a lot of these guys have just most recently lost to Kamaru or beaten someone not particularly convincing. But then that was the case with Edwards. You know, he he hadn't his his best win was over Bilal Muhammad, and it wasn't really a win. It was just one round of domination and then an eye poke. So not a ton more to say about that. Um, maybe have a little laugh about people who were absolutely convinced that Usman could hang at light heavyweight. Um, that was a really insane week where I was laughing at him taking a photo with Jan Blahovic and claiming that he was going to go up to light heavyweight just to pick and choose some fights. And then people were telling me like, no, he could probably beat about 50% light heavyweight. To go. No, if he could, he would. But instead, he does an enormous weight cut like everyone to try and get as much uh, advantage as possible. So rest of this card, largely garbage. Um, but I do want to kick off about how much fun I had in the Luke Rockhold, Paulo Costa fight. Um, Probably the best way Luke Rockhold could go out, to be honest. He'd been talking big game about how the UFC underpays its fighters and how fighters get no health care for things that they sustain in training or, or after a significant length of time 
from the fight. I think Tim Sylvia, his arm, when he got snapped by um, Frank Mir, he got an infection as a result of that break. Like years later in the UFC, we're like, nah, not, not us, mate. Nothing to do with us. Um, you know, which wouldn't be a huge deal if you lived in anywhere but America. But uh, sadly, in America, you need to get a company to provide your health insurance. Or you have to buy your own and it's normally shit and they'll just exclude anything that happens to you. So there was a lot of talk this week, you know, people coming up to Dana and asking him about it and him being like, oh, Luke Rockhold's talking nonsense, blah, blah, blah. And you could see that Luke Rockhold was supposed to get knocked out here and then the UFC would just go, well, Luke Rockhold's talking shit about fighter pay because he hasn't won in years and he's shit and he should go away. Um, He didn't win this fight, but he did give a damn good account of himself. And part of the reason that he has the luxury to go off about the UFC um, is that, and, you know, to not fight for three years, is that he's, uh, I think he was already from quite a wealthy family, but he made a good amount of money modelling. Um, he was a model for Ralph Lauren for a while. Um, very preppy man. But it's interesting because, you know, models, all their money is front-loaded too because they're not going to make it when they're older. Um, but even then, he, he still thought that that was better than the, than the gig fighting. But these last three years, you know, he's been... Um, training, he's just not been able to get to a fight healthy, uh, which is really interesting because he's he went to Henry Hooft for the Joel Romero fight, and then he went to um, Jason Perillo, and you saw uh, Bisping and him, you know, on their Instagram on the mats at uh, Perillo's, which was really sweet. I think that sort of sums up the feeling towards Luke Rockhold among most fans and, and most people who saw him in his prime now. You know, you were quite happy for him to get smoked when he was like a massive douche. But now he's quite a lovable douche. And it's really quite sad that he hasn't won in forever. But um, he had Hooft and um, Perillo in his corner for this fight. So it seems like he's just been able to build his camp and his team around what he's doing. Which is, is, you know, is nice. And I think more fighters should be able to do that. No one from ATT, oh sorry, AKA, which obviously was his team for a very long time. Him, Daniel Cormier and um, Habib were the, the big boys out of there. But the three years off seemed to do him the world of good. This is the weird thing. This fight was a sloppy, sloppy mess because Luke Rockhold almost immediately gassed. And Paulo Costa, I mean, he did keep coming forward, but he was not putting forward much offense. He was holding back a lot is what I felt. And I feel like that was probably due to not wanting to get tired or already being tired. You know, by by the end, they were both completely bollocks. I can't decide if Luke Rockhold, or, or rather if the altitude saved Luke Rockhold here and brought him into a more competitive, exciting fight by both of them being gassed and sloppy, or if the altitude robbed Luke Rockhold of a really good showing, because some of the stuff that he was showing was you know, a lot, a big improvement on where he was even at his best years ago. Um, you know, from a technical perspective, I don't know if he's physically anywhere near that level, but uh, the right hook, you know, the lean back right hook, he's not in the horse stance anymore. He was going to the fence quite a lot because obviously Paul Acosta is going to try and walk you down. Um, especially if you're a southpaw. He can't do it against orthodox fighters, but he can do it against southpaws. He kept leaning down to his left side and throwing the right hook, but he'd have his left uh, forearm up high, ready to take a, a hook or a high kick or whatever. Um, he was, he, yeah, he was throwing it well while staying in a fairly decent position to receive strikes, which was a big improvement on where he was because, you know, you remember... The Yol Romero fight. If you remember every fight up to the Yol Romero fight where he wasn't really punished for it, but the Yol Romero fight, the Michael Bisping fight, going back on a straight line, leaning straight back with his hands down and throwing the, the big swinging right hook and, and getting away with it most of the time because he's so tall and long. But this one, yeah, his, his right hook look, looked much tighter. His left hand looked decent. You know, he was actually throwing it and using it, which was something that he didn't really do enough in his prime and the way he fought sort of boxed him out of his uh, of his uh, left hand. The more sort of side-on, horse stancey, lean-back, right hook stuff, the, the more bladed you go and side-on you go, the further away you're putting your left shoulder from the opponent. So you, your left hand be, it becomes longer. You have to throw it further, to, and, and it has a bigger um, wind-up and tell on it for you to land it. Whereas in this one, he's walking along the fence with his hips fairly square a lot of the time and throwing overhands and left straights off the fence. Um, to good effect. You know, the one where he, he came off the fence and said, fuck you, and then uh, clacked Costa with an overhand and sent him stumbling back. That was great. I thought he was using a, a nice check along the fence because you know along the fence Paulo Costa's going to come in swinging, but a lot of the time he's going to use the right round kick as you circle off to your left to try and 
um, stop you in your tracks and then come down swinging. So he's picking up his lead leg, uh, he's picking up his lead knee and pushing it into Costa as he came in, which made you know awkward, um, fumbly exchanges, but not getting pinned down and beat up. And then there was, there was his left leg work. He had the weird pad on his shin again, um, which made me go, "Oh, I hope he doesn't break his shin immediately again." But came out before he gassed. First good kick he threw was a left round kick to the rear leg, which, oh my God, if you've heard me talk about this once, you've heard me talk about it a hundred times, I love it. Um, Guys get their lead leg beaten up all day in the gym. And if you kick the back leg, you can really surprisingly hurt people. Andy Hoog used to come in against seasoned kickboxers because Kyokushin, you know, his, uh, well, Kyokushin generally, you're standing in a very short stance, you're hammering in body punches a lot of the time and throwing low kicks. And it, a lot of the time, it doesn't really matter what leg you've got forward. You're just, it's a sort of infighting, mauly sort of thing for a lot of it. Um, but a lot of good kickboxers train out of the one stance and get really good out of the one stance. And Andy Hooker would come out and kick him in the back leg and they'd buckle almost immediately. You know, guys like Ray Safo, who'd been kicked in the legs hundreds of times, you know, it took, him, it took Andy Hook a couple of good low kicks on the rear leg to put him down. A lot harder to do in MMA, obviously, because you have to get closer to do it. You have to get closer to the opponent to score on their rear leg, uh, and that puts you even more in danger of them just picking it up and running through you or countering it. But he did it in the last round as well. Uh, he just hammered in the, re- the kick to the rear leg. Um, Costa stumbled around because of it. Lots of back kicks, the odd jumping spinning kick, which took me back to surfer Luke, Luke Rockhold with the long hair, uh, fighting Jacare back in the day in strike force. Good front kicks to the body with his left leg, which I really liked because if you're worried about hurting your shin, slamming it into body kicks that are just hitting the forearm and elbow, um, the front kick up the middle is money. And of course, if you've got a wicked question mark kick anyway, that's uh, another great thing to have in your, another great arrow to have in your quiver. Costa did what he will always do. He walked him down. He threw good swinging combinations. He landed body shots. Uh, he landed uh, right kicks to the body. Um, didn't get much double collar tie work going, I, I think because Luke's tall and uh, you know doesn't really shell up in that way where you can grab the, the double collar tie. If you watch Paulo Costa against shorter opponents, he does love the double collar tie. He'll hammer in some knees. He'll throw an elbow off it. Costa's weird because he's a dummy a lot of the time in terms of a fight IQ, but the things that he does all the time tend to be quite smart. You know, you don't see people work in the body as often as Paulo Costa does. But he got Luke on his back almost immediately in the first round, and uh, that was a big surprise to everyone because Luke Rockhold, obviously great grappler, you'd expect him to be able to get up, and he, he didn't. He got mounted. Um, there was a, a really interesting mount escape, which I'd see, you, you will see, you'll see it from time to time. Hanato Moicano did it against, might have been Cub Swanson, where you get mounted and you sit up, you maybe post your, uh, you do like a lap post, your forearm and hand in their armpit, and you put the other hand to the mat, so you're sitting up into them, and then you scoot your hips back so that your knees pop out from underneath them. Um, sit up escapes for the mount are pretty, you don't see them often, but you will see them more in MMA, because, um, Obviously, the thing to worry about in MMA is guys swinging on you while you're trying to escape. You know, I was watching Marlon Marais versus Mar- uh, Marab Valishvili the other day, and Marlon Marais is doing the right things, but completely ignoring Marab Valishvili hammer fisting him. So a hammer fist is not that bad, and you're going, oh, I can get up through that. But he's ignoring them, and then two or three are connecting, and his brain can't keep up with it, and he just starts like losing control of what he's doing. And then almost getting knocked out. And then obviously later on does get TKO'd. But yeah, really nice um, sit-up escape from Mount from, by Luke. Um, there was another thing he did in the third round when Costa took him down into side control. Oh no, I think he shot a really bad takedown like, onto his face. Like Costa used to do back in the day when he was just a massive dude on tough. It's pretty amazing how quickly Costa became what he is now. You know, his, um, his striking rapidly appeared and then hasn't changed much since. But Rockhold shot a dog shit takedown, absolutely gassed in the third, and uh, Costa ended up on top in side control. But uh, Luke Rockhold did something that I've seen Craig Jones do a lot in rolling, which is you take the arm that's nearest them in side control, which they're normally trying to pull away from your body, but you let it come away from your body and you reach across their back and you grab inside your own thigh. So kind, kind of like the buggy choke that we were talking about, we, we will talk about with um, that disastrous match between Woodson and Saldana. Uh, but the buggy choke is on the head side, 
this this is where you're reaching over the opponent and grabbing your thigh on the body side. So there's no chance of you choking them or anything like that. But what it does do is it locks the opponent to you because there isn't the space. If you encircle their entire waist, there isn't space for them to come into the mount. There isn't space for them to, um, you know, you're holding down their posture so they can't really sit up and elbow you. It worked really well for him in the third round, just keeping Paulo Costa in, in place. And, um, you know, that's that's one of the signs of a seasoned technician in something. You know how to deal with things when you're absolutely gassed. You go, you go like, well, this wouldn't be how I'd get out of this position, but this is how I'm going to stop anything bad happening to me for a minute or two. And Rockhold's been uh, really good with some sneaky positions like that for years. It, Chris Weidman took him down and he held a guillotine and Chris Weidman went to side control. And obviously, you know, we, we've had an epidemic of guys holding guillotines as the guy goes to side control and then getting von Flued by Ovin St. Pru. But he had the arm in guillotine, so he had the arm as well. And um, Weidman passed his guard and then couldn't do anything. So Luke Rockhold's just sort of bridging into him, trying to get back to his butt and sit up, or, or and just holding this guillotine. And basically, it was it was a situation where, did the ref actually stop them and stand them up in the end? Because they were there for about three minutes with Weidman supposedly past the guard and in control, but unable to do anything. But anyway, uh, Rockhold eventually let him move. They were talking smack to each other. Costa gets on his back. And then in the last seconds, Rockhold's able to turn back into him and rub blood into his face, <laughs> which was kind of gross, but not as corny as when BJ Penn did it, I feel. Um, you know, BJ Penn going and rubbing his gloves on the guy after the fight so that he can then lick his gloves. That was, that was pretty fucking cringe. Not quite as cringe as running for governor and then being like, tax is a problem, and then them going, how much is, uh, you know, how what, what is the tax rate in Hawaii? And BJ Penn going, well, I don't know, but it's not good. But anyway, this fight, um, you know, I, I've talked a lot about Luke Rockhold, mainly because I was surprised by some of the looks from him. Um, he looked a lot more interesting on the feet than the last time I saw him. He even had a decent jab, actually, at several points. Um, but Costa looked good, too. You know, he did what he does. Um, he always brings a fight, you know, he, um, win or lose, he's normally, I don't think, has he had any boring fights? You know, he really does live up to the promise. And he looked in really good shape in this one. I mean, he had a fantastic tan, but, uh, yeah, he looked like he didn't struggle with his cut too much. Um, and like, he's got that under control, which is good because he used to be a lot more, I want to say bloaty, but not bloated, you know, more, looked like he had more water in him, um, come fight night previously. But uh, he, was, he was looking really lean, even on fight night. Had great fun with him um, making fun of USADA all week. Because, uh, you know, he was a bodybuilder for a very long time. If you saw him when he was absolutely massive, you know, it's, uh, if you're really into bodybuilding, the chances of you being natty, you know, when that's the one thing you're into, probably quite low. But um, even more than that, everyone in MMA, you know, it's, it's probably. And uh, he's... he's quite enjoys making fun of Yusara about it. The fact, the fact that he's done something like 86 tests and he did technically get caught for an IV, an illegal IV, and then he got that sentence downgraded by cooperating with Yusara. So snitching on drug dealers to get out of a punishment for putting some water in your arm, um, very normal. And as Yusara was like, we need, we need you to tell us how the IV technology works. <laughs> um, that, that broke his streak, so I don't think he's got the jacket yet. But Usada are going to have to give him a jacket at one point, and they're going to have to get him a large one because it'll have to go over his capped delts. And it's going to be hilarious when they do. But thinking about this since the fight, imagine fifth round Leon Edwards, as chaotic as he is. Imagine if he had a family full of pharmacists, how good he'd be. <laughs> oh, anyway, what else was passable from this card? Um, I was very much looking forward to Jose Aldo versus Marab Valishvili, but I completely forgot that this fight was taking place at Elevation. Um, Marab Valishvili has an incredible pace and gas tank, and he still did about half of what he normally does. He attempted a lot of takedowns. Jose Aldo stuffed every single one, but Marab Valishvili threw some strikes in between, and Jose Aldo, he brought back the, the knee a couple of times, which we were talking about in the pre-fight. I was saying, God, I wish he'd go back to intercepting knee Aldo. That's a very early stage of Aldo. Basically predates even low kick Aldo. But, uh, so he landed a couple of really nice knees, but for the most part, he looked, he looked terrified of tiring himself out. He looked more scared of getting tired than he did of anything Dvalishvili was doing. So Dvalishvili picks up the decision by, as we said earlier, if you're going to be in a wrestling exchange the entire time, 
and neither of you accomplishes your goals. The one who is perceived to be actually uh, initiating the clinches and the takedown attempts will probably score better. And, you know, it did help that he threw some strikes in between. Not the most amazing performance from Dvalishvili. Very sad way for the Jose Aldo title run to end because he could have been given a title fight instead of this fight. You know, he's done more than TJ Dillashaw in the last two years. But yeah, I mean, if you've got Aldo anyway, you know, he's always been a low output fighter. Even at his best, he was a low output fighter. Um, recently, you know, think of the Rob Font fight where he was outscored like two to one, but made big moments happen. So he just kept cracking Rob Font and uh, winning the round on a, a good punch. But man, it was a bad decision on his part to, to agree to a fight somewhere with, uh, so far above sea level. But mostly, very uneventful and not fun at all. Um, what else was on here? Wu, Wu Yanan was on the main card of a paid pay-per-view. And she's trash. She's so bad. I was expecting Yan Jianan. In my head, it was Yan Jianan coming in and um, obviously different weight class. But I was already like, well, she's a bit of a crap grappler. But then... Wu Yanan came out, and I went, oh, no, she's really bad on the, on the mat. Um, so Lucy Pudaleva, yeah, got her back and smashed her head in with elbows. It, I mean, it was sort of impressive, but also Wu Yanan has won one in five or something like that in the UFC. Tyson Pedro got Harry Hunsucker out of there quickly, which was cool because he normally starts strong and then somehow explodes later. And he's managed not to do that since he came back from a very long layoff due to injury. Count split, him, split his jab with a good jab and stunned him and then hit him with a right body kick while Hunsucker was wink, uh, blinking out the jab and folded him completely. Hunsucker coming down from heavyweight must have been like, oh no, that's normally where my spare tyre is. <laughs> I'm normally impervious to body shots. But not a 205, mate. And then fucking, you know, light heavyweights and heavyweights. At, why in this card that's being fought at 10,000 feet... Are you having fucking Marcin Tabura and Alexander Romanov? You know, Romanov did the Romanov thing for one round and then spent rounds two and three pretending that he was striking and pretending that he was winning the striking. I love that when dudes aren't actually going to strike because they're tired, but they'll showboat and pretend that they've done stuff, hoping that the judges are looking away from it and then go, oh, well, he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be showboating if he wasn't winning decisively. And I'm laughing at Romanov, but better fighters than Romanov have, have, got away with trying to do that. You know, think of um, Anderson Silva versus Meyer. There were huge swathes of that fight where he was doing nothing but showboating just so he didn't have to engage Meyer. But Tabura picked up the majority decision. A um, lot of people angry that the first round wasn't scored a 10-8 to Romanov because Tabura did literally nothing except get thrown in the first round. Um, so really probably should have been a draw and it would have been the second draw on the card. Um, you know what? Well, the rest of the fights are crap. Let's talk about the funny one. Sean Woodson versus Lewis Saldana. I'm trying to work out if this is funnier than Sam Alvey losing a uh, losing a fight where his opponent had two points deducted, because that was pretty funny. But this one, Lewis Saldana scores a beautiful counter left hook as Woodson's jabbing in with his right hand low, then disappears off camera for a while, <laughs> and everyone's going. What, where was he? Because you're watching Sean Woodson pick himself up from the floor and then you realise that the other guy isn't in the camera shot. Uh, it turns out when they showed the replays, he was off on the other side of the ring taunting and then getting down on his knees himself to taunt some more. Unbelievably stupid move. Then he drops Woodson again with a counter jab, runs up and knees him in the head. Number one thing you don't do in, uh, well... MMA under almost any rules. Has this man ever fought in Japan or Valle Tudo? Um, he's fighting out of Phoenix, Arizona. So I'm guessing not. Midwest K Championship. Um, RFA. Yeah, no. This guy hasn't fought anywhere where he would be soccer kicking people or kneeing them in the head on the ground. What is wrong with you, mate? Uh, just amazingly bad fight IQ. Celebrates the win when the ref pulls him off. So massive adrenaline dump as well. In addition to the uh, to the elevation, fights the rest of the fight like shit. And Sean Woodson just sort of bobbles along. Sean Woodson was out of it, but as soon as the refs stopped the fight to give him a timeout, and he has five minutes, Sean Woodson's going, "Hell yeah, I can go again!" And you go, his corner are trying to scream at him, "Don't 
no, don't do it. Um, but you have to be in a neutral corner, and sometimes you just can't hear your uh, your corner when you're uh, responding to being injured. Um, sorry, or um, being fouled. I think this was Mike Beltran refing this one because he also refed uh, Paul Acosta versus Luke Rockhold, which was you know a, a big sloppy mess, and he was so funny in that. Luke Rockhold got hit with a right uppercut to the cup, which Paul Acosta also did to Uriah uh, Uriah Hall. So rare to see a punch go low in MMA because so few people throw body shots, but Paul Acosta actually does, and as a result, he often punches people in the cup. Costa also thought he'd won the fight, celebrated, and then got reminded that he, or got informed that he hadn't won the fight. But that whole thing was chaos. And then Mike Beltran is always calling people, sir, he's saying, over there, sir, over there, sir, do you understand? You know, he's always trying to be quite formal. And then he turns around after trying to wrangle Costa. He, he wrangled Luke Rockhold. He tried to wrangle Costa off the fence and tell him, no, you fouled him. It's not the end of the fight, blah, blah, blah. He turns back to Costa, who's... He turns and sees Rockhold talking to his coach coaches through the the, uh, the fence in the wrong corner. <laughs> he just goes, "What are you doing, dude? Get to the neutral corner." Uh, really great break with character. But yeah, man, Saldana let Woodson back into the fight. Ends up getting a draw, uh, a split draw. But I'm quite impressed that they scored it a draw. Oh, he ended up in a buggy choke for all of round two. I forgot that too. Um, the buggy choke. You're seeing the reason that it's so annoying in jujitsu. There isn't really a, a nice counter to it yet. Most people put an elbow on the on the neck and try and put pressure through, which doesn't really work. Or they'll put an elbow on the neck, pass the chin off to the knee, um, which can sort of work. But the choke is a legitimate threat, and the knee on the face isn't. So, yeah, it's it's a bit tricky. You can't really pick the guy up and slam them because it's, yeah, it's just a hard thing to do. And if you do, you lift your chest up. And the opponent lets go and goes back to guard, which was you know half the point of using the buggy choke to try and create openings. But Woodson, I mean, he was he was out of it, and he took the buggy choke. And the way that the rules work, you know, side control is a dominant position for Saldana allegedly. So and Woodson is in a serious submission attempt allegedly. So there's no way the ref's going to break it and stand him up. And if he did, even though it was going on for like three minutes, people would be crucifying him online. There was a guy, uh, a ref stood a uh, fighter up out of a buggy choke in some Russian orc the other day, uh, and Kaposa linked the clip on Twitter, and the comments were just full of jiu-jitsu people being like, yeah, good, fuck them. <laughs> that is that is how annoying the buggy choke is at the moment. Hoping that we can come together and, you know, invent a counter for it. So anything I haven't already trashed was probably trash, um... Man, Leonardo Santos, I was talking about this on the pre-fight show, but, you know, it's, it's a struggle to look forward to him anymore because he's he's not working on his gas tank. Um, he's not working on his wrestling. He's an amazing grappler. He Basically, knocking out Kevin Lee and being decent with his hands was the worst thing that ever happened to him because now he has no urgency to get the fight to the ground. Um, and, yeah, by the third round, he's already gassed. So why, as a 42-year-old gasser, would you then agree to fight at elevation? I'm going to keep saying it, but it's driving me mental. Man looked gassed from the second minute of the fight, and Jared Gordon just sort of stayed in his face, put in enough work to get the win. Um, was not really exciting. There were some nice body shots in the first round, but uh, other than that, ho-hum. Angelusa versus AJ Fletcher was interesting. Um, Fletcher looked smooth, and then Angelusa... It was almost like he got the confidence to pitch a right hand at Fletcher's head, realised that Fletcher was never going to get away from him, and, and just kept throwing it. Amir Albazi versus Francisco Figueroa. That actually was impressive, Albazi. He was um, he was cutting the cage well, giving Francisco, uh, Francisco Figueroa a lot of trouble. Obviously, Francisco Figueroa, not nearly as talented as his brother, uh, no matter how much they try and sell that on the commentary. But um, I really liked Albazi's work in this one. Uh, Arichi Leng versus Jay Perrin was fine. And then Victor Altamirano versus Daniel De Silva. Fun because the guy who had the worst striking very clearly on the feet, um, if you, yeah, everyone looked at that and went, why is he striking with this guy who's so much more explosive and um, mechanically clean? But yeah, just a well timed left knee. I think it was a left overhand to left knee. Uh, something Benil Dariush does a lot. But anytime you could just get a guy to overcommit his elbow away from his body, you can hit the knee to that floating rib or liver or solar plexus. And all of those really hurt. 
So yeah, an okay night of fights. Um, very glad I got it on BT Sports and don't have to pay eighty dollars for it. But um, I think my standout of the night. Uh, oh, I mean, obviously you've got to give Leon Edwards his standout of the night. But Luke Rockhold. I mean, that's a really good way to go out for a guy who was so famous for being chinny, for a guy who everyone memed on so many gifts of him being knocked out and stills of him being stiff as a board. Um, to come out and take the best shots from this big, scary hitter. Um, you know, I, I said he's not like a super crisp hitter. He's more like a bludgeons you with volume kind of hitter. He's a, he's a strong puncher rather than a snappy puncher. But he still hits decently hard. And Luke took some square on the chin, sucked it up, went after him. You know, and he, he really did look like, you know how like late era Michael Jordan or late era Muhammad Ali, you know, you, you put on 10 pounds of muscle to make up for not being as fast and explosive as you used to be. He looked like that. He just looked like grizzled old man, Luke Rockhold. And there's always going to be what ifs about his career because he did take big breaks. Um, you know, and he made some odd decisions, you know, the going up to like heavyweight, which I feel like, you know, he really jumped in at the deep end because he took on Jan Blachowicz. And I wouldn't say anyone should go up to like heavyweight and fight someone who's... But I think he was in the title picture at the time, but, you know, you caught him right on the crest of the wave towards the title. Uh, you know, Jan Blachowicz was really becoming something special and Luke Rockhold seemed to think he could just jump in at a new weight and he really looked undersized, under strength, un underpowered um, in that fight. Light heavyweight maybe should have been a process where he slowly moved up. He took a couple of easier fights. Not even easier, but just not guys who are jumping, not trying to jump in halfway through someone else's title run. And the other... Uh, what if that always exists with Luke Rockhold is what if he'd stuck to grappling? Because I think he won the world's purple belt or something like that. And everyone who trains with him, including people like Gordon Ryan, say, do you know he's got really good grappling? Luke Rockhold. <laughs> so it would have been you know, very interesting. There were a lot of things Luke Rockhold could have done. And unfortunately, he often picked the ones that weren't to do with fighting, like uh, dating Demi Lovato and being a professional model. But um, I, I'm sure he made his bag and uh, he deserved it. Anyway, on that nice thought about two handsome men smacking each other in the head and then bleeding all over each other, um, let's leave it there for today. If you want to sign up to the Patreon, support the podcast, get access to the boycasts and extra articles that I write, please do. Um, if you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing anytime, fightprimer.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack, the Brummy Mumbler buying a house for his Brummy Mum, bless. <laughs>